How y'all good people doing? You got a Saturday night, late night edition, wealth transfer blueprint. And I thought I'd spend a little bit of time maybe doing a quick Q&A. It's Saturday night, about nine o'clock Eastern time. And um, I'm a homebody type guy, so I don't really go out on the town anymore. In my younger days, I would get out on Saturdays and, and, and have some fun, but right now I'm, I'm, I'm 56, so having fun to me is just hanging at home and doing the things that I enjoy doing, like listening to music and that type of thing. So I figured, you know something, why not do a, 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 a late night Q&A based around my wealth transfer blueprint? Answer some questions that you guys might have as it relates to building wealth. I thought I'd take some time out and do that. And if you guys got questions, certainly go ahead and start dropping them in and I will start answering them as I see them come through. Hopefully you guys got out today and took care of your health. Y'all know I'm big on this health thing. As I get older, it's more and more important that I, you know, focus on my health every day. I just gotta do that. I got some news that a couple of my relatives, male relatives, um, matter of fact, my cousins, two of them got some, you know, they got some concerning news about their health. And one of them is my age. And then the other one is a little bit younger than me. But man, let me tell you, that is not good news. That's not something any of us want to hear, right? So I think it's important that you focus on your health and make sure your health is good. Get out every day if you can and, and exercise. You know, I don't care if it's 20 minutes a day. Get out and do some exercise. Make sure you um, take your health serious. I, I know we talk a lot on this channel about building wealth and, 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 and getting to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but trust me on this, guys. If you don't have health, that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow don't mean nothing. So you got to focus on that health every single day. Um, I do, do my very best to get out every day and walk four miles, um, stretching, you know, certainly trying to eat a good, sensible, I know diet is the wrong word I'm trying to find here, but just, just a nutritious meals. Try to, try to do your best to, to put good, good stuff in your body, right? In your temple. And drink plenty of water. That's, that's, I, do, I drink a lot of water. I don't like drinking water, but I, I drink it because I know my body is made up of 70% water. So we got to get this H2O in us. And I try to drink as much as I can, right? I know it's important. So I, I definitely have to do that. Guys, if you want up to 15 free stocks, Moomoo Moo is going to give you up to 15 free stocks when you open a new Moomoo Moo brokerage account. Um, they're going to give you up to 15 free stocks for just trying out their brokerage app. You put $100 in, they're going to give you five free stocks. You put $1,000 in, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. There's a link down in the description box of this video. Go click on that Moomoo Moo link. Open up your new Moomoo Moo account today. Go get that free stock. Go get that free money. Moomoo Moo is my primary brokerage app that I'm going to be using in 2024 and beyond to buy my paper assets, to build wealth over the next 10 years, to double my net worth. That's my goal. I recommend you guys have a good brokerage app to use to buy your paper assets. If you don't have one or if you're not happy with the one that you're currently using, try Moomoo Moo out. Give them a shot. Like I said, it's, 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 no, yo, it's free. All you got to do is click on the link, sign up, 
and boom, put you some money in the account and you're ready to go. I really like Moomoo because they give you in-app tutorials. People email me all the time. Hey, Richard, how do I do this? How do I do that? It's nice that I can go direct them right back to the Moomoo app and say, hey, click on discover, then click on learn, and then boom, you're going to see all the tutorials that they have that you can click on and learn anything you want to learn about the Moomoo brokerage app as it relates to investing to build wealth. So I think it's a great brokerage app for that. I don't know many brokerage apps that provide in-app tutorials so that you can put yourself in a position to go ahead and learn how to build wealth the proper way. So if you're interested in that Moomoo Moo app, like I said, click on the link down in the description box. Well, guys, you all know 2024 is a very important year for me, and I hope it's a very important year for you guys. I think 2024 starts the new bull market, right? The new, the new bull market as it relates to paper assets. You know, for several years, we had been in a, a bear market where, you know, all of these great companies and these great ETFs that we're going to talk about tonight were trading at a discount. Now, recently we've seen some really good rallies by the stock market. We've seen the S&P 500. We've seen that get over 5,000 points. We've seen the NASDAQ get to around 40,000 points. We've seen, I'm sorry, the Dow Jones Industrial Average get to 40,000 points. Not the NASDAQ, but the Dow. The NASDAQ has got to about 16,000 points or, or better, right? So my point is the stock market itself is, is starting to move and it's moving right now because of anticipation. The market investors are anticipating that the Fed will be reducing short term interest rates sometime in 2024. So in anticipation of that, they're starting to pick up their activity in the stock market. So now we're starting to see the stock market rally. We had, a, we had a really strong 2023, especially the last two months of 2023 were amazing. One of the best nine to 10 week runs we've had in stock market history. We've seen 2024, January of 2024, the first week of January, we saw activity slow down, but now it's starting to pick back up again. And again, that's because of anticipation. Investors are looking forward to the Fed reducing short-term interest rates. That's why I think 2024 is going to be key and critical for us as investors to put ourselves in a position and be ready to build this wealth. Now, we got to have a long-term outlook, though, right? We have to have a long-term outlook. We can't look at this thing short-term or we don't win. So we got to look at it long-term. That's why in my wealth transfer blueprint, I have a 10-year hold pattern. I'm going to be buying assets, paper assets, three paper assets in particular, every single month, every single year for 10 years. That's the blueprint. It includes SPLG, which is a S&P 500 ETF that tracks the S&P 500 index. SPLG is the ticker symbol. FTEC is a information technology ETF. And one of the main companies in that ETF, in that information technology ETF, is NVIDIA. If you've been following NVIDIA, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a heavyweight. It's a major player when it comes to computer chips, right? It's a major player in this new AI revolution. So I believe in that tech industry, specifically information technology. So FTEC is going to be my sector specific ETF that I'm buying. That's the ticker symbol, FTEC. And then, of course, the third investment is made up of seven individual stocks. 
They call them the Magnificent Seven. So those are my three investments in my wealth transfer blueprint. 50% of my money. Now, if I got to, I'm going to tell you exactly how I'm breaking it down. And then we'll get to some questions. The way I'm breaking it down is this way. So 50% of the money that I'm going to be investing on a monthly basis is going to go into SPLG. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want that money, that 50% of everything that I'm investing, I want it in the broader stock market. And I believe the S&P 500 gives me the broader stock market. So I want 50% of my money going into the broader stock market. I want to have every industry in every sector. And I get that in the S&P 500. I got growth companies. I got value companies. I got companies that pay a dividend. I got companies that don't pay a dividend. It's all in the S&P 500. It represents the broader stock market. So for every dollar I invest, 50 cents of that dollar is going to SPLG. Right? 30 cents of every dollar I invest is going into a sector ETF, specifically the technology sector through Information Technology ETF, FTEC. Why am I doing that? Because technology is the future. Some people might say, well, some of those companies are already in the S&P, which is true but it's totally different investments. One is a sector, the technology sector. It's only focused on technology companies. Most of them are fast growing. S&P 500 is not a technology ETF. It's a universal ETF that includes all of our industries. So I got all of our industries over here, which include real estate, consumer discretionary, healthcare, energy, right? So it has all the other sectors in the S&P. That's why it's the broader stock market. Now I'm getting specific to an industry, which is the technology industry. And that's where 30, 30 cents of every dollar I put into the stock market is going to that sector ETF. And I think it's a heavyweight. And then obviously my last 20 cents of every dollar I invest in 2024 and beyond is going into the Magnificent Seven. Apple, Microsoft, Meta, Amazon, Alphabet, NVIDIA, and Tesla. That is the Magnificent Seven. Now, some people have sent me emails and asked me and said, hey, Richard, I got a certain amount of money I can invest. I don't have an unlimited amount of money I can invest. I got $100 a month. I got $200 a month. I got $500 a month. What should I be focused on? Should I be trying to focus on all three of those big boy blue chip investments or should I focus on one because of the amount of money I have to invest? Am I... Answer to them is, guys, if I can only pick one investment to invest in, only one investment, that's all I could pick, it would be an S&P 500 ETF. Why? Because it has all of that in it. It has all the Magnificent Seven in it, and it has all of the information technology companies that are in my tech ETF. Most of those guys are going to be in your S&P 500, not all of them, but most of them, at least the heavyweights like NVIDIA, MasterCard, PayPal, they're all in the S&P 500, right? So if I only could do one investment, it's the S&P 500. That's it. I have every single industry in America covered in the S&P 500 value company, companies and growth companies. So if I could only pick one investment, guys, it would be the S&P 500 ETF. And my particular S&P 500 ETF is SPLG. So hopefully that answers your question on what is my blueprint? My blueprint is to take a certain amount of money every single month through dollar cost averaging. Same day, every month, like clockwork.
and I'm gonna put it in these three investments. 50% S&P 500, 30% FTEC, 20% Magnificent Seven. Over and over and over and over and over for 10 years. Why 10 years? Because the S&P 500 for the last 10 years has increased its value by 3,000 points. It's more than doubled itself in 10 years. My goal is to double my net worth in 10 years. So I believe in 10 more years, the S&P 500 will go from 5,000 points to 10,000 points. That will double my net worth. Along with FTEC, and obviously, you know what the Magnificent Seven are doing if you've been following them. Game busters. And guys, I keep telling y'all, this is just the beginning. That's my opinion now. You know, I'm not an expert at this and I'm not your financial advisor. I'm just telling you, we ain't even seen the real rally yet. The, the real bull market ain't even started yet. Once the Fed starts reducing interest rates and start introducing cheap money to the market again, it's going through the roof. It's going through the roof in my opinion. So I'm positioning myself buying now, buying, 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 and I'm going to keep buying until I get to uh, 2034. That's when I'll bring my head up and say, well, okay, let me see what I've done. I'm just going to keep my head down, keep earning, keep what I earn, and invest what I keep for 10 straight years. So a lot of people, hey, well, uh, what, it, oh, do I got to do it for 10 years? I, you do it for however long you want to do it. It's your, it's your plan. If you copy my plan, it's 10 years. Why 10 years? I explain why. Because I want to double my money. I believe the S&P 500 will double itself in 10 years. How do you know that? I don't know it, but I know it just did it the last 10 years. From 2014 to 2024, it more than doubled itself. It went from 2,000 points in 2014 to 5,000 points in 2024. I'm just going off history. History says it'll double itself again. I believe in that history. I believe it will. So I'm going to be invested every single month. Why are you invested every single month? Because I need to be in the market 365 days a year. I don't want to miss one day. I don't know when I'm going to have a bounce day. I don't know when I'm going to have a rally day. I can't miss one of those days. I got to be in the market every day. That's why I'm dollar cost averaging. I don't pick and choose. Oh, I'm going to do it this month. I'm going to miss three months. You miss three months, you might miss three or four important days. Wealth days. Remember, hey, couple... Hey, Couple, couple, couple days, uh, but last week, if you missed last week, I, I mean, when, when NVIDIA came out with his fourth quarter earnings, it, it, it just took off for a couple of days. The market just, whew. if you wasn't invested, you missed those days. You missed it. You missed two of the most important days of 2024. I keep telling y'all, we're only going to get probably 10 to 15 of those days this year. That's why you got to be in the market every single day. That's the wealth transfer blueprint is to be in the market every single day. 365 days a year for 10 years. Now, of course, the market is closed on holidays and weekends. But I don't care. I still want my money invested. I don't want to miss any bounce days. I don't want to miss any rally days. The only way I am 100% sure, sure I don't miss any of those days I got to be in the market. I can't be out here trying to time the market. You understand what I'm saying? So the wealth transfer blueprint is to take a certain amount of money every single month for the next 10 years and invest it in those three assets. Exactly how I told you I'm going to invest it. 50% in the S&P 500, 30% in information technology ETF, and then 20% in the Magnificent Seven. That's how I'm chopping it up. Every single month for 10 years. How long do you need to do it? That's up to you and your financial plan. Whatever you're trying to accomplish, you got to back into that with a plan. Right? My plan calls for 10 years of just keeping my head down, earning money, keeping what I earn, and then invest what I keep. That's it. How are my three investments doing? They're doing great. They're doing great. They did amazing in 2023. I think SPLG in 2023 was over 20% ROI. FTEC, 
in 2023 was over a 40% ROI. And then the Magnificent Seven in 2023 was over 100% ROI. Now, will they do that in 24? I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I'm going to find out because I think it ain't even, we ain't even seen what's finna get ready to happen. Once these Fed starts reducing these rates, which they will, but they may not do it until June, but that's okay. It don't take much. Like I told you, tail end of 2023, guys, we had nine weeks in November and December of last year that the market went bananas. Had you not been invested, you missed it. If you were invested, you made out like really nice. So that's my point, guys. The whole key to this investing thing for me is just dollar cost averaging and staying in the market every single day. 365 days a year, I'm in the market through dollar cost averaging. I'm not sitting on the sideline trying to time the market. We don't want to do that because we can't win. We won't win. We don't have enough information to do that. We just got to be in the market every day so that way we don't need to know any information. All we need to know is historically, the stock market has done this in a 10-year block. I believe it'll do that in the next 10-year block. And that's what I'm hanging my hat on, right? Now, there'll be some good years. There'll be some bad years. But I believe there'll be more good years than there will be bad years. That's what I believe. That's my history because I've been doing this for 25 years, right? So all I'm telling you is, is this. You got to position yourself. You got to be ready to go. Or you're going to get left behind. You're going to get left behind. And 10 years from now, you're going to look and say, well, golly, what happened? How, how did all these people build wealth and I didn't build anything? I can tell you how it happens. Procrastination, fear, listening to the wrong people, being indecisive. If you're going to be a wealth man, you got to, you got to create a level of decisiveness. And all that means is... Take action. Take action. Right. That's that's being decisive. When I make my decision to do something, boom, I'm doing it. That's decisive. Right. I don't need to be procrastinating. Oh, well, you know, I got to wait till I read uh, uh, stock market investing for beginners. I got to read that book first before I can invest. No, you don't. The book ain't going to tell you nothing. You ain't just I just I didn't just tell you. Right. Right. All I'm saying is, guys, we don't got to be the expert. That's the reason I'm giving you my blueprint, because I'm not the expert. I just copied my blueprint from somebody else. That's all. I I'm not I'm not the only one investing in SPLG. I'm not the only one investing in FT F FTEC. And I'm not the only one investing in the Magnificent Seven. I'm not. There are many people. There are millions of people out there that's doing this, guys. The question is, are you going to do it? That's the question. The question is, are you going to do it? So I got one question right here from one person that says, I'm retiring in three years. What should I do? If you're retiring in three years, you, you, you should already had a game plan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, you should have had a game plan. I mean, you're talking about three years from now. Yes, you can build some wealth, but I, I don't know how much wealth you can build in three years. It depends on how much money you're going to be dedicating to that wealth building effort, but three years till retirement and you're just starting to think about it, you're behind the eight ball a little bit. Now, I don't know your full financial picture, so I can't, let me take that back. I can't say you're behind the eight ball because I don't really know what you got going on. I don't know your full financial picture. But, but, if, but if you're saying, hey, what should I be doing and I'm retiring in three years, it makes me think you don't have a game plan. So if you don't have a game plan right now, you could still copy my plan. The key, though, is, is you got to decide what are you trying to accomplish in those three years? What am I trying to accomplish? Do I want to take my net worth from 100K to 500K in those three years? Those investments can help you do that. The key, though, is, is you're going to have to put more money in those investments because you're starting off late. Remember, I got a 10 year window here, guys. I'm not doing this for the next three years. I'm doing it for the next 10 years because I understand it takes time for the money that I'm investing in these three investments to compound and grow at the magnitude I need it to grow. I'm trying to double my net worth. I'm trying to double my net worth. I'm not going to double my net worth overnight. 
it's going to take me 10 years. See, I'm okay with that, though. And I'm a 56-year-old guy. And I'm okay with doubling my net worth in 10 years. W what else am I going to do? Why well, I got to be so impatient? See, that's what a lot of us, we, we get hung up on our, we're just not patient enough. Again, don't know this gentleman's thing why he's retiring in three years, but, but, but makes me think he's, he's probably a little bit behind the eight ball. So here's the deal. Copy my plan. Appreciate the super chat, man. I appreciate that, uh, Tanner Collins. Thank you, man. Appreciate you. I'm going to get, let me see here. I'm going to get to you. I'm going to get to you, Tanner. Don't worry about it. I'm going to get to you. I'm on my phone here, but I'll get to you. I'll figure out how to, how to pull, your, pull your comment, your question back. But I see it right here. I'll get to it. I don't know in these next three years what you're trying to get the net worth to. Because I keep telling y'all, the net worth, the assets generate the passive income. And they got to be big enough, right? They got to be big enough. The assets got to be big enough in order to generate passive income. They got to be big enough. Right. It got to be big enough. So I don't know what your your ultimate goal is. You know, I don't know what your net worth ultimate goal is, but whatever it is. You need to figure out how much money do you need to be investing every single month in these three assets or whatever assets you decide to put it in. You need to figure out how much money do I need to invest at what rate of return do I need in order to get me to my nest egg in three years? That's the math you got to do. If you do that math, I think you got a good chance and you got to have obviously income because that's your number one tool to build wealth. So if I want to go from 100,000 net worth to 500,000 net worth, that's a $400,000 net worth jump in three years. You better have a lot of cash to be putting into these investments. $100 a month ain't going to get it. $1,000 a month ain't going to get it. It's not. It's not, guys. It's not going to get it. So all I'm telling you is, is figure out what you're trying to get accomplished. Make sure when you're setting your goals, guys, you pass them through three gates. They need to go through three gates when you're setting goals for yourself. Every goal you set for yourself needs to pass through these three gates. Is it realistic? Is it measurable? And is it actionable? Those are the three gates. All of your goals you set for yourself, whether they be short term or long term, they need to pass through those three gates. Right. We don't want to set ourselves up for failure is what I'm saying. Make sure you're setting goals that don't set you up for failure. Right. All right. Let me look at this super chat here. Let me see if I can figure this thing out. Oh, here we go. Here we go. I think I can figure it out. Let me see if I can find it. Find this super chat. There we go. I'm 29 years old. In my Roth IRA, do you think I should consistently... All right. Slow down here, buddy. Keep on fading out on me. I'm 29 years old. In my Roth IRA, do you think I should consistently invest 50% in the S&P, 50% in the tech ETF? I won't touch my Roth until 59 and a half. I currently have zero in the stock market. L listen, uh, listen, <laughs> I think, let me, let me make sure. Tanner, listen, man, I think that's a fantastic plan. You're talking about 50% going in the S&P, right? SPLG or, or, or something equivalent to that, right? And then you're talking about 50% going into FTEC or something equivalent to that, basically a, a tech ETF and an S&P 500 ETF. Absolutely. I think that's a great plan. Now, here's the question, though. It, it, it goes back to the, the previous question. Same answer for you that I gave this gentleman. It's not enough, guys, to just say I'm going to put 50 percent of what I invest in here, 50 percent in here. What you really got to ask yourself is, what am I trying to get accomplished? What am I trying to build my net worth to? Because the net worth creates the income. So if I'm putting $100 a month in, my net worth is going to be a lot smaller at 59 and a half is if I'm putting $5,000 a month in. My net worth is going to be a lot bigger. 50 and 50, right? So Tanner, what you got to do, man, is you got to say to yourself, what am I trying to accomplish? 
Am I trying to have an, a, a seven-figure net worth? Do I want to have a do I want to have a million-dollar net worth? Do I want to have a two million dollar net worth? Do I want to have a three million dollar net worth? Because see, once you decide on the net worth, then you can back into how much money you have to actually put in these investments and what type of return you need to get over that period of time in order to accomplish the net worth. It's just not enough, guys, to say, I'm going to put one hundred dollars a month in. I'm going to put a thousand a month in. But I have no idea what I'm trying to accomplish. You'll quit. Soon as you hit a financial bump in the road, you will quit. Why? Because you have no compelling reason. You have no, no, you have no uh, end result. Right? So you've got to know what you're trying to accomplish. See, I know what I'm trying to accomplish. I need to double my net worth. Whatever my net worth is today, I want it doubled in 10 years. So now what do I do? Okay, Richard, you want it doubled. How much money do you need to put into this investment every single month? at an 8% rate of return to double your net worth. Oh, okay, I need to put in X amount every single month. As long as I can get an 8% rate of return over that 10 year period, putting this amount of money in, I should double my net worth. See, now I'm Gucci, I'm good to go. I'm, all I gotta do now is go out and earn, take that money, put it in that investment, and, and wait, and be patient, and be consistent and disciplined. I do that. I'm a win. So you got to know what your end result is, guys. You got to have that solidified in order for it to make sense. Let's see. Anybody else we got out here? Uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, let's see what we got. Here's one. Is it wise to invest in a single stock, let's see. Uh oh, sorry about that, guys. Is it wise to invest in a single stock? I have a little extra to play with. <laughs> well, listen, man, it's your financial freedom. You can do whatever you want to do, but personally, I wouldn't invest in one single stock. Why? Because 100% of your money is concentrated in one stock. If that one stock has a bad quarter, a bad year, a bad 10 years, you ain't going to build no wealth because all your money tied up in one company, one stock. No, don't put all your money in one stock. I keep telling y'all guys, anytime you're out here picking individual stocks and that's your portfolio, you're the expert. You got to be the expert. You got to be able to pick winners and losers. None of us are going to be able to pick winners and losers and outperform the S&P 500. We're just not, guys. I mean, you got Wall Street firms investment firms that can't outperform the S&P 500 and they got billions of dollars. How in the world are you going to outperform it? You're not. Now, you might get lucky one year and buy NVIDIA one year and you got lucky, but 10 years in a row, you're going to get lucky 10 years in a row to outperform the S&P? I don't think so, man. I don't think so. You won't. So no, no, I don't recommend anybody putting all their money into one stock. And again, I, my channel is not about short term. Yeah, let me go, you know, let me go short Tesla and I'm going to do I'm going to do 10 options. I'm going to do five calls. I'm going to do 10 puts. That's not my channel, guys, because I don't understand any of that. I don't understand any of that. All I understand is traditional investing. Put my money in these three investments every single month through dollar cost averaging and waiting. That's all I do. I don't do anything else. I don't recommend people uh, generally like us, the 99 percenters, and that's not a bad thing. I don't, I don't recommend we try to be the expert. I recommend we lean on companies that are already the expert. Like SPLG is a State Street ETF that tracks the S&P 500. State Street is the expert. That fund is a proven track record. When I'm looking at FTEC, that's a Fidelity ETF. Fidelity is proven, man. That fund is proven. When I'm, looking at the, when I'm looking at the Magnificent Seven, you notice I don't have 50% of my money going into Magnificent Seven. I don't have 30% of my money going into Magnificent Seven. I don't have 80% of my money going. No, 20% of my money is going into the Magnificent Seven. 80% of my money is passively invested in proven ETFs. 80%. 20% goes into the Magnificent Seven. There's a reason, because I don't want to be the expert. I don't want to be on the hook over these next 10 years trying to pick winners and losers. 
So that's all I'm telling you. You decide whatever you want to do. If you want to build your stock portfolio where you got a hundred different stocks in there, go right ahead, man. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Knock yourself out. I wouldn't do it. One, I don't have the time to be fooling around with trying to pick a hundred stocks. I don't have time for that. I got better things to do with my life than to be worrying about a hundred stocks, trying to manage them and see who's doing good, who ain't doing good. Mm -mm. See, I can go to SPLG. One of those 500 companies they got in there ain't doing well. They boot them out, put another one in. I ain't got to do nothing. Same thing with uh, FTEC. One of them 374 information technology companies ain't carrying its weight. Boot them out. They put another one in. I ain't got to do nothing. Passive, passively managed funds, man, with low expense ratios. <laughs> and they proven, right? 10 year, 10 year track record is proven. Right. So all I'm telling you is, man, figure out something that you can put your money in that has a proven track record, a historically proven track record of performance. And I think the three investments that I'm going to be using, they have that. Do you still buy at the dips? Yes, absolutely. See, you got to understand, guys, if you're dollar cost averaging in, you are buying the dip. Some days you're going to buy the dip. Some days you won't. If you're dollar cost averaging in, you're buying the dip because what will happen is. Over the course of 10 years, guys, the stock market is going to be up and down. One day I buy at this price. Next day I buy at a lower price. Next day I may buy at a higher price. Next day I might buy at a lower price. So you're buying the dip anyways if your dollar cost averaging in every month. You're buying the dip. It, it ain't no special time to buy the dip, but you just buy the dip through naturally investing every single month. Because every single month, the market might be up or down. I'm okay with that. Well, why would you buy when the market is going down? Because that's where you build wealth. <laughs> I mean, you build wealth by buying the dip. And then when it goes back up, you make money. That's why. Oh, well, why would you buy when it's going up? Because I think it's going to go higher. See, the key, guys, to building wealth is buy low, sell high. But I just do it over a long period of time. Some people do it over days. I don't do it like that. I do it over a long period of time. See, if I buy consistently every single month, the average cost of my shares are going to be less than somebody that just buys sporadically over the 10 years. My shares are going to be, I'm going to buy mine lower at a lower price. For example, let's say I buy SPLG and it's trading at $60 a share today. And over the next 10 years, it goes up to $300 a share. So over that 10 year period, I've been buying at $60 a share, $58 a share, $65 a share, $62 a share, $75. And then all of a sudden it goes all up. My average cost for my shares are going to be a lot less than somebody that just tries to time the market over that 10 year period. It's proven that dollar cost averaging works better. That's why I do it that way. Now, if I got extra money on the sideline, above and beyond what I'm investing every single month, which I do, then yes, I will buy the dip. Right? Of course I would. But I don't just hang my whole investment strategy on buying the dip sporadically. I'm going to wait and wait and wait until NVIDIA falls. I ain't going to buy anything until NVIDIA falls. What if NVIDIA don't fall? Then what you going to do? What if it just keep going up? Then you just sat out on the sideline a whole year and got nothing because you waiting for NVIDIA to drop. But if you'd have bought in at $800 a share, now it's $1,600 a share. You'd have doubled your money. That's why I tell y'all guys, you can't be out here trying to time the market because you don't know what these stocks are going to do. You don't know what these ETFs are do. You don't have enough intel. You're not a one percenter. You're not a politician. These people get privy to all that information before you and I. We don't have that information. So guess what? If I'm going to buy in the video, I'm just going to buy it right now. I'm not going to wait. Oh, golly, I'm going to wait because it's going to crash and it's going to go from $800 a share to $300 a share. I'm just going to sit here and wait for 10 years and it never happens. And then you just stuck like Chuck. You got no wealth because you only on the sideline waiting on something to go down in price. No, buy it now. What if it go to $3,000 a share in the next five years? Then what you going to do?
You're going to be looking like you're going to be looking stupid. So stop trying to time the market. Just It's a good company, guys. NVIDIA is a great company. It's a great company. Guess what? In 2022, it was under $200 a share. Guess where it's at today? $800 a share. $700, $750, $700, $800 a share. Less than two years. And you got people out here, and I'm not saying that this will happen, but you got people out here saying this thing going to go to $3,000 a share, man, over the next five years. If it don't split. They're saying this thing is going to go to $3,000. See, that's why I'm just buying, man. I don't care nothing about no $800, $800 a share. I'm buying. Because, see, I believe the thing going to be $3,000 a share. I believe that. Now, if it does, great. If it don't, hey, man, that's the... That's the hey, listen, man, I got to take some risk if I want the reward. Right? I don't get no reward without no risk. No reward for you. No reward if you're not willing to put some risk into the game, baby. I'm willing to put some calculated risk. That's why I got 20% of my money going into these individual stocks. I'm not going to I'm not gonna hang my hat. 100% of my money ain't going in them. Uh-uh. 20%. That other 80% going into a sure thing. That 20%, that's what I'm going to ride with the Magnificent Seven on. That's it. No more than that. Because I don't need to be the expert. I don't need to be caught up in that, right? I want to be diversified in the whole market. Every industry, every sector. That's why I get the S&P 500, because that gives me that. That's where 50% of my money goes. All else fails, that 50% is going to go in something broad-based. Multiple companies. 500 of the biggest companies in America are in that fund. I, I'm safe, in my opinion, as long as I stay in there long enough, right? How do you know you're safe? Because I, all, the, all the billionaires, that's where they got their money. When all the billionaires take their money out of the stock market, I'll take mine out. When Zuckerberg take all his out of Facebook, I'll take mine out. When Jeff Bezos take all his money out of Amazon, I'll take all of mine out. When Buffett take all his money out of the stock market, I'll take all mine out. <laughs> I ain't going nowhere till they go somewhere. Hey, no, boy, you ain't got to be a rocket scientist. You just got to follow those guys. That's all you got to do. I keep telling y'all, y'all around right here trying to get a PhD and learning how to uh, the stock market. You need a PhD in the stock market. Mm -mm. Just follow them. That's all you got to do. Just follow the people who make all this money in the market. Follow those folks. And that's what I do. I just follow them. Like I said, yeah, Zuckerberg sell all his Facebook stock, then I'll sell mine. But until he sell his, I ain't selling mine. Mm -mm. No, no, no. CEO of NVIDIA sell all his shares, then I'll sell mine. That's how I look at it. I, I, ain't, I, ain't, mm -mm. I ain't trying to recreate the wheel. I'm going to just use the wheel that's already working. What do I need to recreate the wheel for? So all I'm telling you is you can copy my plan, create your own plan. But you better have a, an end game. You better have a result you're trying to reach. And then you got to back into that result. So let's see what we got out here are questions. Let me see if we got anything. Bull market going to run to the end of 2025. No, I think it's going to go longer than that. I think it's going to go longer than that. I think we're going to, I think we're going to have a, 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 a period of prosperity over the next 10 years in the market. That's what I believe. That doesn't mean we don't have a, we don't have a, a, a bounce or, you know, a, 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 a little small, little bear market in between where we have a little sell off. I, I'm not saying that, but I think it'll be a period of 10 years of prosperity. From 2024 to 2034, I think we're going to be have a period of prosperity, especially when these interest rates start coming down. Now, that's what I believe. You guys don't got to rock with that. I'm just telling you what I'm rocking with. I'm just telling you what I'm rocking with. I'm rocking with these next 10 years. And this is my last full 10 years in the stock market, because at that point, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm I'm in the golden years. I'm exiting. I'm going to take all of my net worth out of there. Might keep a little bit in there. I might keep 25% in, but I'm gonna take 75% out and go put it in income, income generating assets at that point, right? Because right now I'm looking for growth. I don't care about the income. I don't care about the dividends other than having them reinvested back into buying more shares. I don't need the income to live off of. What I need is the growth. When it's time for me to live off the income, I will take them out of equities, take them out of growth, and go put them in income, right? I'll go put them in income at that point. 
But for now, these next 10 years, I need growth. I need growth. So if you're looking for growth, if you're in the building stage of wealth, in my opinion, you need growth. If you're in the enjoyment stage of wealth, you may have a little bit of growth need, but you probably need to be chasing income because you're probably living off of your assets right now. If you're in the golden years, you're probably chasing income, right? You're saying, okay, I've gotten all the growth I've needed over the last number of years. Now I need to get some income off of these assets. Now I got to move it out of growth and go find me some income driven investments, right? So that's my plan in 10 years. I transition 75% of my wealth out of the stock market and I take that 75% of my wealth and I'm going to put it into income investments, whether it be real estate for income, whether it be um, high paying dividend stocks, high paying ETF dividend paying stocks, maybe it's U.S. Treasury bonds, maybe it's laddered CDs. Whatever I need to do in order to get, a, to get me 6% rate of return on my money to, to pay for my lifestyle from my assets. So what I do is, is I build my assets where I'm getting somewhere between an 8 to 10% return when I'm building the assets. Now, when I go to get income from the assets, I go find me something that can at least give me 6%. Right? I get 6% on whatever my net worth is. Let's use uh, as an example... Let's say I want to build my net worth to two million bucks. So I'm putting my money in the stock market, putting my money in the stock market, putting my money in my three wealth uh, transfer assets. And then I boom, 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 I'm at two million. I say, OK, that's my goal. My goal was two million. I'm ready to retire. I'm done. Then I take my money out of the equities, out of the stock market. I take my money out and I go... Maybe not totally out of the stock market. When I say the stock market, I'm talking about growth companies. I take it out of the growth companies and then I go put it in income. Like I said, real estate, high paying dividend stocks, something that's going to give me a 6% rate of return, but also protect my principal. Now I need to protect my principal because my principal is what pays my bills through the interest that I earn on my principal. Right. So now I take my I want to protect my principal, but I want to get income to take care of myself since I'm not out here working anymore or actively earning income. That's why your assets are so important, guys, because it, it builds wealth for you. Right. Let me see what we got in here. I had another uh, super chat. Let me find that. How is it viable for the boomers to remove their wealth to all all at the same time in terms of the. Next three generations, you know, baby boomers are not moving all of their wealth out of uh, the stock market. I think what you're seeing is baby boomers are saying, OK, what's my lifestyle? How much does it take for me to live my lifestyle? If a baby boomer says, hey, I need eight grand a month to live the lifestyle I want. Right now, if you got eight grand a month, if you need eight grand a month, you times that by 200, which is the rule of 200. So if I need eight grand a month, I times it by 200. That means that baby boomer, in order to get eight grand a month, needs $1.6 million in their nest egg. Now, if they got that in their nest egg, right? If they got that in their nest egg, then they can take that 1.6 million times six. It's going to give them about $96,000 a year in income. So, so they're going to get about $96,000 a year in income. Now, if they want to take it all out, they can, but most of them don't. So what they'll do is, is they'll say, well, okay, let me take 60% of it and move it to something safe. Maybe like a U.S. Treasury bond or laddered CDs or something like that. And maybe they leave 40% in the market because they still want a little bit of growth because they don't want to outlive their money. Inflation is going up every year, guys, right? Price of our goods and services are going to go up every year. So we got to outpace that, right, with, with the interest we earn on our, in, on our, on our assets. So not, all baby boomers are not taking all of their money out of the stock market. They may be repositioning their money so that it ain't 100% it ain't in equities. Maybe they got 25% in equities, 75% over here in something else that protects it. But the goal is with anybody that retires and they live off of their assets, 
they got to be able to put it in something that can generate enough income to pay for their lifestyle. Like I said, if that baby boomer wants $8,000 a month in income, that means they need $96,000 a year coming from somewhere. Nine out of 10 times is going to come from their investments, right? So their investments have to be in something. They don't necessarily have to be in the stock market. Maybe they put it in real estate. I don't know. But they got to put it somewhere where it'll generate $96,000 in income is what I'm saying. So hopefully that answered your question. And I appreciate the super chat as well. Let's see what else we got here, guys. Um, we got anything else in here? Like I said, if you guys want to get to the top of the list on the questions, you certainly can. Super chat. That'll definitely ping and, and get right up front. Dividend stock should be only be used in the tax advantaged accounts. You get taxed. <laughs> Boy, I tell you. I love these folks get over these chats, man, and be just saying stuff and don't be knowing nothing about what they're talking about. But hey, whatever, man. That's that's a whole different whatever you believe is whatever you believe, man. Would you say it's too late to buy the Mag 7? No. I keep did you not just have you just did you just get in the chat? Did you just get in the chat? Seriously, let me go back and look at this. Let me go back and look at this. He must have just got in the chat. You had to just get in the chat. Would you say it's too late to buy the Mag 7 since they are already gone to the moon or could you still get in? Yeah, you just got in the chat. No, it's not too late, man. Let me ask you a question. Let me ask y'all all y'all this question. Do you believe the Magnificent 7 is more valuable today than they were five years ago or 10 years ago? Do you? Do you believe the Magnificent Seven right now today is more valuable than they were five years ago? Simple question. Do you believe they're more valuable? And if you do believe they're more valuable, wouldn't it make sense that in another five years, they'll probably be more valuable in five years than they are today? So, so th that's the, this, is the, this is the thing, guys, with the stock market. If you stay in, if you have a strategy to buy through dollar cost averaging and you stay in and you're in good companies, they're going to be more valuable tomorrow than they are today. S&P 500 in 2014 was 2,000 points. Like I told you earlier, today it's 5,000 points. In 10 years, it more than doubled itself. I believe the Magnificent Seven will be worth, worth more 10 years from now than they are today. So you dang on right I'm about to day. I don't care what the video is trading at. I think it will go higher, much higher. But that's a chance you take. Nothing in this investment world is guaranteed. Now, you can sit on the sideline and say, well, it's too high. I'm not going to get in. And then it doubles itself in another two years. And then you're going to look at yourself and be like, golly, why didn't I get in? <laughs> why didn't I get in at 800? Now it's trading at 16. Now it's trading at 24. Now it's trading at $3,000 a share. Why didn't I get in? Again, I'm not saying that that's guaranteed. But my point is, you guys got to you got to start thinking about where did they, where were they yesterday compared to today and where will they be tomorrow? I think they'd be worth more tomorrow than they are today. That's all. Yeah. Heck yeah. I'm going to be investing them till the cows come home. I think I thought I had some super chat. I had another. Oh, here we go. Moses. Moses. OG. Appreciate the super chat. Richard. Uh oh, it's, 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 it's trying to get away from me. I'm going to get it back here. Come on, buddy. Rich, NVIDIA is having an AI meeting later this month. Do you think it may cause the stock to increase even higher? It depends, man. You know it depends on what they're meeting on. Now, we know they're a huge player in the AI boom, right? My guess is if it's anything to do with increasing technology for them where they can be more of a contributor to this AI boom, yeah, I think the only thing drives NVIDIA stock down, guys, this is my opinion now, I'm no expert here, but the only thing drives them down if they don't hit expectations when their quarterly earnings reports come out. That's the only thing that drives them down at this point, guys, right? Now, don't get me wrong, if we have an overall economy crashes and we go into a recession, that's all companies are going to get hit. 
But if things stay the same and they keep on the trajectory we're on and these guys continue exceeding expectations when it comes to their earnings, this stock going to keep going through the roof, man. I'm telling you. So I, I personally believe the only thing that hurts them is if they have, if they missed expectations on their earnings, right? If they, if they just blow it, if they just make a wrong decision and blow it, that's the only thing hurts them. Or if the economy as a whole just collapses, right? It, it, which could happen. But other than that, man, I, 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 I think there'll be a thousand dollars a share. I, I think there'll be 15. I, I think there'll be $1,200 a share by the end of the year. That's my opinion. So I'm buying. I'm going to keep buying. I ain't, ain't going to stop buying. I ain't going to stop buying. My goal is they get the $3,000 a share. And I'm going to buy as much as I can right now while, while they on sale. I still look at them on sale. Uh, let's see who. I think we got Daniel next. Let me get Daniel here. Yep, we got Daniel next. Super chat, Daniel. Let's see. Come on, Daniel. Where you at? Here we go. I got about 30000 in VU. Should I move it? To SPLG. No, absolutely not. I wouldn't move it. What I would do is, is I'd leave it in VU. I'd leave my 30K in VU and just let it keep riding out. What I would do then is I would start a second one with SPLG. Now, that's just my recommendation. You do whatever you want to do. It's your financial freedom. If you want to move everything to SPLG, then, then do it. I, I'm not stopping you. I'm just telling you if it was me, I would just leave v, v, VOO alone and I'd start me a new one with SPLG. Because I'm in that situation. I didn't sell all my VU. Leave it alone. I got VU and VU OOG. I mean, I got VU G and VU, right? So I didn't sell them. I just left them alone and I just pivoted and all future contributions go into SPLG. That's what I did. But, but, but again, you figure out what's best for you, but I mean, VU's still a home run to me. I, you know, my thing with VU, and like I've said before, I just don't think it'll grow as fast as SPLG. So, so therefore, I think it's more upside for me in SPLG because it has so much more room to grow. For VU to double itself, it got to get to almost $1,000 a share, man, over the next 10 years. Can it do that? Absolutely. But, but, but I'd rather hang my hat on SPLG doubling or tripling itself over the next 10 years as opposed to VU. I, that's just me. But you guys do what you feel is best. Let me see what we got in here. I'm, I know I missed another super chat. Let me, let me find it. And then we'll keep rolling. Okay, got that one. I think I had one more here. Let me see here. Yeah, it said John. Oh, he just, he just hit, hit, hit the like button for me. Thank you, man. I appreciate it, John, for the super chat. Appreciate you, man. Appreciate you. So, so that's, that, that's kind of where we're at, man. You know, uh, let's see here. I'm new. I'm new to all of this, bro. I need help. Where do I start with a hundred dollar stinks? SPLG, man. Go down to that description box. Click on that Moomoo Moo link. Open up that Moomoo Moo account. Transfer that hundred dollars in it. Get yourself five free stocks and then go ahead and start buying SPLG. Now, here's the kicker, though, guys. Here's the kicker. Can't do it one time. $100 ain't going to get it. $100 not going to build no wealth. $100 not going to build no wealth. But $100 for the next 10 years will build wealth. $100 every month for the next 10 years will build wealth. $1,000 a month for the next 10 years will build wealth. You do $1,000 a month for the next 10 years, you get an 8% rate of return. You got about a quarter of a million dollars in your nest egg. You do $2,000 a month for the next 10 years, with at least the 8% rate of return, you got a half a million dollars in your nest egg. I'm just telling you guys, that's what history says. I can't guarantee that, but history says if you can get that 8% rate of return, which I don't know why you wouldn't because the S&P 500 over the last 90 years, seven to 10% rate of return on average. So, hey man, I wasn't that good in math, but I can follow that math. See, the, the, the problem a lot of people have is, is they have no consistency and no discipline. They're too sporadic. They're too easily rattled. They have no delayed gratification in them. They got all instant gratification. They want it now. They have no patience. If you have some patience, guys, and you can discipline yourself and be consistent, throw your $1,000 a month in there, $500 a month, $2,000 a month, and you wait them 10 years and you just do that faithfully and give up some of this other short-term stuff, 
I'm telling you, man, you can build wealth. That's my opinion. You can build wealth. Wouldn't Vu's price, let's see here what this, what this question is. Wouldn't Vu's stock price correlate to the price of each share? And if it was Apple rises 25 Vu, no, not necessarily. Oh, golly, I keep messing this thing up. Vu shares of Apple rise 25%. Well, you got to understand, man, VU has 500 companies in it. And Apple ain't going to be no 25% of the VU. The Magnificent Seven together is only 28% weight. The other 72% of the weight is for the other 493 other companies. So it's weighted differently, and that weight changes depending upon the powers that be in the S&P 500 index. It changes. The weight changes, right? It changes. So, um, you know, VU is going to do fine. I just don't believe personally VU is going to double itself in the next 10 years. I, I, it could, but I'd rather, I rather go a different direction. I've had my time in VU, and that's okay. If you decide you want to stay in VU, stay in there. Ain't nothing wrong with VU, guys. I'm not against VU. I love VU. I made a lot of money in VU. I just decided to go a different direction and try something new. That's okay. As investors, we don't have to agree on everything. I'm no expert here. I can't analyze everything about VU and I don't care about all that. I just don't believe it will. That don't mean it won't. I'm just telling you what I believe. You can believe something totally different and both of us can be okay and be right in our own opinion, right? I'm, a, I'm an expert in my own opinion. That don't mean I'm an expert about VU. I'm not. I, I don't know everything about VU. All I know is, is I was in it for a lot of years, made my money, and I'm just ready to try something different that potentially can offer me a better return long term. That's all. Maybe it will, maybe it won't, but it's my money and that's the chance and the choice that I make and that's how we have to roll as investors, right? Let's see what else we got here. I bought SMCI at 816, now it's 905 going to the moon. That's all I'm saying, guys. I mean, if you believe in the company and you believe in the stock, you believe in the ETF, and it has a historically proven track record of multiplying money, that, that's what you roll with. I mean, no one's going to be an expert here. We're all taking a risk when we put our money in the stock market, but I'm taking a risk when I get up in the morning and go out to do my four-mile walk. I'm taking a risk that Joker could just run over me. But I'm willing to take that risk so I can keep my, my health right. So we just risk in life, man. Ain't nothing, oh, golly, I don't want to take no risk. Well, you're going to be broke. You ain't going to build wealth. You're going to take some risk. You're going to take some risk. You got to if you're going to build wealth. You got to take some risk, whether it be real estate, whether it be in a business, whether it be in the stock market. You're going to take some risk if you're going to build wealth. You're going to take some risk. So just get, get, get comfortable with that and just hang your hat on investments that have a historical track record of performance. That's all I do. I just hang my hat on investments that have a historical track record of performance. So I do my homework to make sure historically they can do what I believe they need to do in the future, right? So that's that. So let me see what else we got here before we get ready to, we're gonna wrap this thing up here in a few minutes, but let me see if I got any other questions in here. I missed any super chats. All right, let's see what we got here. Does the value of Moomoo go up if the price of milk rises? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, y'all ain't got no sense, man. I ain't answering that question, man. Ain't nothing. Y'all crazy, man. Move, <laughs> move. That was a good one, though. So, yeah, man. Here's my. Okay, let me see what we got here. Still curious who introduced you to investing, Rich? Well, I tell you, man, I, I've been investing since I was about 30 years old, and I'm 56 now, so about 26 years. And I was in the banking industry. So when I got into the banking industry, I didn't know anything about investing. And some of the people who I work with were participating in the company-sponsored 401k program. I didn't know what a 401k, 401k was. I didn't know what that was. And I, you know, so I started asking them questions. They said, yeah, we don't know everything about it, Richard, but what we do know is it's an investment, it's tax, you know, it's tax deferred, you know, a company's going to give you a match. It's like saving for your retirement. So, you just, you know, you're investing in stock, you're investing in mutual funds. So I got a little bit of, I still didn't know what was going on. But I said to myself, I ain't got no other choice. These people doing it, they seem to know what they're doing. Let me try it. So I started trying it. And then as I continued to invest a little bit of money, 
that little bit of money started turning into more money and then more money. And then 26 years later, boom, I'm, I'm where I'm at today. So still not an expert, just know if I can invest in something that has a solid track record and I can do it long enough, I got an opportunity to build some wealth. Here's a question. Should I pause my retirement to save for my house down payment? I'm 40 and 4K in retirement, 25K for the house. Let me ask you a question. Is that house going to produce any income for you when you retire? Is it going to produce any income? I mean, guys, if I'm in the building stage of wealth, I got a choice. I can sink my money into a house that produces no income and it's a dead asset. It takes money out of my pocket or I can put my money in assets that do produce income that do, you know, that put money. You know, it puts money in my pocket that, that me personally, if it's buy a house and, and get no income. Yes, I'm going to get appreciation on the property if I buy it in the right location. Yes. But you guys got to understand, I live in the house. I don't. OK, the appreciation is good, but it, it means nothing until I sell it. Until I sell it. So, so if your goal is to buy a house in the right location and stay in it for 10 years and then sell it for a big old amount of money, then maybe that's the right move for you. But most people don't do that. My thing is look at what you're trying to get accomplished and ask yourself anytime you buy an asset, ask yourself, does this asset put money in my pocket or does it take money out of my pocket? Right? Does it create income or does, uh, uh, does, not, does it not create income? If I'm in the building stage of wealth, I need to be putting my money in something that's going to create assets that generate income on a monthly basis. Now, that don't mean you don't go out and buy a house. If you can do both, do both. But if I can only do one or the other, personally, I would invest in assets that actually pay, pay, will pay me, right? Pay me a dividend, pay me in, in growth, right? Build assets for me so that I can generate passive income. The only way a house is going to do that for you is if you, if you rent it out, you got to rent it out, right? You got to rent it out, Airbnb it, rent it out. Now, if you're comfortable with that, I ain't comfortable with strangers living in my house. I'm sorry. That's just how I roll. I don't need no house hat. I don't need no roommates, I don't need nobody, uh, I barely know living in my garage, convert, no. And I'm not saying you don't have to do that, guys. I'm just telling you, for me, that ain't the right thing. So, so for me, it was about buying these houses, putting tenants in them. I would buy a house, live in it for a, a year or two, put a tenant in it. Buy another house, live in it for a year or two, put a tenant in it. Buy another house, live in it for a year or two, put a tenant in it. That's what I did when I started building my real estate portfolio. I'd buy it so I could get good terms, put me a tenant in it a year or two later. Buy another one, put a tenant in it a year or two later. Buy another one, put a tenant. I just kept doing that, right? Until I got a big enough portfolio where it started making sense, right? So you just got to figure out where you're at in your situation. And if buying that house is going to get you to your pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, buy it. But that's the question you got to ask yourself. Is this house going to get me to my pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? And the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow does what? Produces income. Passive income that takes care of me. If that house is not going to do that for me, then guess what I do? I don't buy it. I go buy assets that will do that for me. And then when I get to the end, when I get to the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow and I got assets that's generating income, then I go buy the house because now my assets can pay for it. That's what I would do. But you do what you got to do. It's your financial freedom. It's your journey. I'm just giving you my personal opinion, how I feel about real estate and um, what, what, you know, if it's real estate for income, I'm all for it. I appreciate it, Jay Cannon, for the super chat. Stocks better than cryptocurrency. In my opinion, they are. In my opinion, stocks are, are, are much better than cryptocurrency. That's just my opinion. Cryptocurrency has no, no underlying value. None. No product, no service. Nothing. It's just whatever somebody is willing to pay for it. That's all. Guy, you buy it for $25,000 a coin, some other joker come along and willing to give you $30,000 a coin for it, you sell it to him. You just made, you just put it off on him. Now he got to go find a joker to give him 
more money for it. It don't got no value associated with it. There's no underlying value. Everybody talked about the blockchain and all this. Blockchain ain't done nothing. What the blockchain, what, what's done, what business is done on the blockchain around here? Tell me one of y'all that done done something on the blockchain. Who done bought a piece of real estate and it's on the blockchain? Who done went to a car dealership and bought a car and it's on the blockchain? I mean, who goes to the grocery store and it's on the blockchain? I mean, it's ridiculous. But that's my opinion, guys. I know I'm going to trigger some of y'all, but that's, that's my opinion. I'm not a crypto guy. I think it's the biggest Ponzi scheme in the history of the world. <laughs> Just the biggest part of this. Haven't y'all learned y'all lesson with these crypto exchanges and these crypto lenders ripping y'all off for billions of dollars in the last couple of years? Have you guys not learned anything with crypto? I mean, these people have ripped y'all off for billions and billions and billions of your hard-earned money, and y'all still ain't learned. These people done scammed y'all with all these pump and dump meme coins and then scam so many of y'all out of billions of dollars and y'all still ain't learned. Y'all still trying to buy crypto when it don't have no value associated with it. When only but a handful of jokers own all the real crypto and they call crypto wells. These guys manipulate the crypto market to their advantage. I mean, it's just, I don't know, man. Invest in whatever you want to invest in. Me personally, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole. Not me. I ain't going to do it. I hang my hat on NVIDIA. I hang my hat on SPLG. I hang my hat on FTEC. I ain't got time to be worried about something that ain't got no operating company, don't got no products or services, just whatever the next joker willing to pay for it or not willing to pay for it. Nah, I'm going to pass on that. House isn't only a financial decision, it's also a lifestyle decision. Yeah, when you got assets to pay for it, <laughs> I don't know what kind of lifestyle decision this is when you got a $4,000 mortgage payment and you can't pay for it. That ain't, that, that's, that's, that's not a good lifestyle decision. It's a lifestyle decision when you got assets that are generating enough income to pay for it. Then that's a lifestyle decision. You out here around a $4,000 mortgage payment and you, 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 can, you live in paycheck to paycheck, credit card debt, no emergency fund, no retirement savings. I'm not sure who would make that lifestyle choice. I certainly wouldn't, but hey, each his own, right? Each his own. Each his own. Let's see, we got anything else in here before we get out of here? We got about, I'm going to do about 10 more minutes, guys, and then I'm going to get out of here. Let me see what we got here. Do you prefer REITs or utilities for dividends? You know something? That's a good question. REITs or utilities? I'm going to probably go with utilities, honestly. I love REITs, don't get me wrong, but I just, the dividends just ain't high enough for me. I like utilities. I like telecommunications companies. Um, really, I like individual stocks. When it comes to dip, real good dividends, companies like AT&T, um, yeah, I go find the, the, the big boy companies Individual comp individual stock companies, I go find them if I'm if, if I'm looking for dividends, right? I go find them like AT&T and, and companies like that that are behemoths. I mean, I'm talking about they are behemoths. And the way they attract new investors is through that dividend. So they pay a higher dividend because that's the only way they attract new investors, right? Because they're not gonna grow as fast anymore. So I would go look for companies like that and get me a five, six percent yield every year from them. And, you know, AT&T stock is not going to go through the roof. It's not going to go through the floor. It's going to trade where it's trading at, and that's where it's going to trade. No matter come hell or high water, it's going to kind of trade right there. So you're not really worried about losing your money. What you're really chasing is income. So if I can get me a 5% yield or a 6% yield a year from them, that's a great income, man. You see what I'm saying? So I don't necessarily worry about dividends or REITs because a REIT, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but a REIT is going to be hard to outperform from a dividend standpoint, AT&T or, or, or like Exxon or some of these other behemoths that pay these big old gigantic dividends. It's just hard to outperform them when it comes to their dividends because they're so big and so profitable. It's just hard to beat them. Or you can go to the, like a U.S. Treasury bond. You got a two-year Treasury bond right now that's trading at what, 45 
4.6% for a two-year treasury bond. And I think the 10-year is over 4%. So if I'm in the enjoyment stage of wealth and I'm just trying to get income and protect my principal, I might go treasury bonds, man. I mean, get my 4 or 5 percent from my treasury bonds. I may even go to my bank and get me, go on, have them go on the open market and buy, and I'll get me a ladder CD portfolio from different banks all around, but they facilitate it for me. I, I'm on a nonprofit here in the area that I live in. We just did that with one of the banks here. We had them go out with some of our reserve money for the nonprofit, and they went out and got us a, a, a ladder CDs like, you know, six months, nine months, 12 months, 15 month maturities, staggered, right? And, and all of them are coming in like high fours, low fives from an interest rate standpoint. Guaranteed money, protected, FDIC insured because they're laddered in different banks. So you, you avoid the 250,000 limit. When you ladder them like that, you can go through one individual bank if they offer this laddering program and then that bank will go out to like six other banks and you can ladder them, get great returns, and be protected by FDIC insurance. So I, you, there's things like that you can do, man, when you're in the income stage. But most of us are in the building stage. We're not in the income stage yet. So when you're in the building stage, I think your best opportunity is equities. I don't need no bonds when I'm in the building stage. I need growth, right? Now, when I'm, like I said, when I'm transitioning out of growth and I need income, then I'll go chase bonds. Yeah, I'll go chase some bonds. So, yeah, that's what you kind of got to hang your hat on. So we got anything in here? Uh, oh, here we got one right here from, from, from Mike. The transparency aspect of the blockchain technology extremely overlooked. Right now, and, it, and I get it, it's new, but this is something you, you want. You want to be able to be see where every dollar is going. I get it, Mike, but, you know, I ain't, listen, man, I'm, I'm, I'm in the golden years and 10 years. I ain't got no 50 years to wait on the blockchain to do whatever it's going to do. I need my money right now. I need my growth right now. I, I, ain't, I ain't trying to wait to no uh, 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 year 2080. I ain't trying to wait on that. I need mine right now. So if blockchain ain't ready right now, what's the point of it? What's the point of me investing in crypto? Because that's really the, the value, right? If the blockchain is the value, but it ain't fully developed and ain't ready to go, then why am I investing in that? That's why I say it's a Ponzi scheme to me, because you don't have any underlying value. You, blockchain ain't ready. It ain't ready yet. It might be ready in 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, but it ain't ready right now. NVIDIA ready right now. Apple ready right now. SPLG right now. FTEC right now. Right now, I'm, I'm getting mine right now. I ain't got to be waiting no 10, no 30 years for the blockchain. So all I'm saying is invest in whatever you want to. Uh, crypto is not my thing. I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't touch it with a 10 foot pole because it's just, uh, it's a house of cards to me. It's a, it's a Ponzi scheme. Uh, you, got, you got a handful of people that control all the, the crypto wealth. And they move how they want to move. They set, they set this thing up how they want to set it up. They rug pull when they want to rug pull. You got all these, these crypto lenders, these crypto exchanges, all these uh, pump and dumps that happen over. It just for me, it just, it's just unregulated, the wild, wild west. And I just, mm -mm. I need to put my money in something that at least is regulated. You know, the SEC is, is all over the stock market. So I, I, I'm more comfortable with that. Uh, but but each is on. Uh, uh, nothing wrong with it. Each is on. Do 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 whatever you feel like you need to do. Uh, me personally, I, no, I, I don't care nothing about it. It's just not. Yeah, okay. I know digital dollar is coming. See, the key word is coming. I don't know what coming means. That could be a hundred years from now, man. Ain't nobody paying with no digital currency right now, man. You can't go to your grocery store and pay for nothing with no digital currency. I keep telling you, what, what, who who? It's coming. It's coming. What, what, what does that mean? <laughs> if I can't go to my grocery store and, and pay for stuff with my digital currency, what good is it? Right? I can't buy a house with it. Who going to take it? I mean, maybe some parts of the world you can. But, it, but my point is, it's not everyday transactable business digital currency. It's not. You're talking about when you look at, look at who actually accepts digital currency. Who accepts payment by cryptocurrency? 
Tell me, I mean, there's not a lot of people that do. Yeah, okay, credit cards are digital currency. Come on, man, you know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm talking about crypto. We ain't talking about no credit cards. We're talking about crypto. Who accepts crypto for payment on a large scale? Nobody accepts crypto on a large scale to transact business on a daily basis. I can't go to Starbucks and say I'm paying with crypto. So it's just, yeah, it's, it, for me, it ain't my cup of tea. Not today, not 100 years from now, it won't be my cup of tea. You guys do whatever you want to do with your money. That's fine with me. I, I know how I'm going to double my net worth. The, the old-fashioned way. <laughs> I'm going to double my net worth the old-fashioned way. 100 years of proof. 100 years of proof. That's how I'm going to double mine. Not something that done been around since 2009. And then done, 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 done stole billions of dollars from people. I ain't going to double my money with that. Mm-mm. No Sersky. All right, let me see what we got before we get out of here, man. It's late night live stream. Let's see what else we got in here before we get out of here, guys. Uh, let's see. I am a landlord and own two properties, and I deal with tenants and repairs, etc. Yeah. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Unless you fire a property management company, you probably are going to have to deal with them. But that's okay. Hey, you, you buy your property. Look, listen, guys, here, here's a secret to real estate and tenants. You buy your property in the right location, you ain't going to have no problem with your tenants. I'm just telling you. Just keeping it a buck. You buy it in the right location where people have a desire to live, low crime, growing, growing population, Right. Decent uh, average incomes. Good amenities. You buy in the right location, you ain't have no problem with no tenants. I, man, I, listen, guys, I done bought real estate for 25 years and had tenants in those properties. I never had no problem with tenants paying their rent. Why? Because I bought in the right neighborhoods. I bought in neighborhoods that I would live in. But now if you start buying stuff that's a little suspect, you know, crime rate up. People ain't working. People all laundering all over the place. You're on your own, man. You're going to have some problems. I'm just telling you. You're going to have problems. I never had problems with tenants. Never. Why? Because I bought in neighborhoods that I would live in. It's all about location with real estate, guys. If you want better tenants, buy in better locations. That's my advice to you. Richard. Here's a question about real estate. Let's, let's roll back down here. Richard, I own 10 rentals. Do I need to put each property in 10 different LLCs? If so, would be expensive. I own real estate for 25 years, guys, in my personal name. No LLCs. None. None. All I did was when I bought each property, when I, when I insured the property, I always had a liability rider on that policy. So if somebody slipped and fell, bumped the head, they wanted to sue me, Already got the liability rider on the insurance, uh, the, the uh, rental property insurance uh, rider. I just That's all I did. I, I didn't need no 10 different LLCs. Why would I do it and create that nightmare for myself? I didn't do that. What I did is I had a, a Schedule E, a Schedule E to my 1040 tax return that my CPA would list all of my properties on. It contained gross rents, expenses, net profit. He did all the depreciation, all that stuff through that Schedule E. That's all I did, man. All my properties were in my name. I just had property insurance with liability riders on the, you know, just in case. And again, I never had any problems with that. Again, I bought in the right neighborhoods where people have a desire to live, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, that don't mean you don't have to go out and get 10 LLCs. But for me, it was a nightmare, right? Because the more LLCs I have, the more complicated lending money to me becomes for a lender. When you walk in and you got all these 10 LLCs with different this and different that, you know, people start looking like, at you like a business and they're going to be like, no, we don't want to lend you nothing residential. You got, you, you're a business. You go over here in that line. Now you're going to get higher interest rates, right? 
You're going to have to put more money down. And in some cases, they may not even want to give you a 30-year fixed anymore. So you just got to be, for me, it wasn't right for me. I just kept them in my personal name because I wanted to be clean and easy to understand when I went to my lender. And all my lender had to do was I give them my two years of personal tax returns. They go in there and pull out that Schedule E. They can see my properties real clean. I didn't go in there with no notebook full of tax returns for every little LLC. I didn't do all of that. I just purchased liability insurance on these property. And that covered me in case somebody tried to sue me. Right. And, and again, you got to understand, I got loans on all of my properties anyway. So that's going to deter somebody from trying to sue me for that because they got loans on. Them. They don't take priority lien over the loan. The mortgage lender, the mortgage lender gets priority lien. Right. So most people ain't going to try to sue you if you got loans on your properties because the mortgage company gets priority over them. They don't they don't jump up, jump ahead of the the mortgage company because they decide they want to sue you. Now, yeah, I guess they could come after you if you got, a, you know, a bunch of cash laying around in the bank. But when I was buying real estate like that, I didn't have that kind of cash. All my money was tied up in my real estate properties or it was tied up in retirement accounts, which they can't touch anyways through suing me. They can't touch my retirement accounts. They couldn't touch really the real estate because they all had loans on them. So I don't know what they're going to sue me for. Right. So but that, that was my way. I did mine. You do yours how you want to do it. But all these LLCs people be setting up. I don't I don't know. I just don't think all that's necessary. I just think it makes it more complicated. And and people then all of a sudden lenders start looking at you and they be like, oh, you got 10 tax returns. I don't, are you really a residential guy or are you really a commercial guy? We need to move you over to the commercial group. And then your terms, your rates, all that stuff go out the window. You can't get no more, you know, at least in my opinion. But you do what you got to do. All right, guys, five minutes and we out of here. We'll be on this thing for almost 90 minutes. We're going to get out of here in about three minutes. Let's see if I got anything in here. That's where I'm at now. Have each insurance at 500K. Follow you. Bingo. Exactly. He, he hit the nail right on the head, man. Well, all right, guys. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. Appreciate you. Do me a favor. Lock it in with a thumbs up before you get out of here. Appreciate y'all hanging out on the late night q and I appreciate you hanging out with me on this late night q and I know, know we're pushing it a little bit. It's getting late. So I'm going to get ready to get out of here and, and get me a little bit of shut eye. But I want y'all to lock it in for me with a thumbs up if you don't mind, if you appreciate the, the Q&A, the live stream. We might start doing these on the weekends, maybe like on a Saturday or a Friday night. Maybe we, we, we tap in about 9 o'clock Eastern time and do this late night Q&A type thing every now and then just to kind of get some of y'all's questions answered. Um, because norm, normally in my regular daily live streams, I don't answer no questions because I'm on a mission, right? I'm just trying to get this information to you. I don't get sidetracked with questions, but I like in these late night, I'm going to start doing these late night. When I say late night, I'm talking about like 9 a.m. Eastern time. That's late night for me. Um, we'll start doing some of these, start doing some of these Q&As just to kind of answer some questions for you guys. Um, so I appreciate y'all rocking with me, man. Hit that like button before you get out of here. Appreciate all you guys who did the super chats. Thank you so much. I I appreciate you uh, 200%. Thank you for the super chats. Uh, it, it, it helps a lot. So thank you very much. I, I appreciate you. Again, lock it in with the thumbs up, guys, before you get out of here. If you want those 15 free stocks from Moomoo, you got to click on that link down in the description box. Open up that Moomoo account today. Put $100 in there. They're going to give you five free stocks. You put $1,000 in there, they're going to give you 15 free stocks. Then you are ready to buy paper assets to start building your wealth over the next 10 years. Now, if you want to copy my plan, certainly copy my plan or create your own plan. I just went through what my plan is. But for you guys who jumped on here late and was not able to hear it, just send me an email uh, and let me know you want to get that video for the three wealth transfer blueprint assets that I'm going to be buying in 2024 and beyond, and I'll send you the video. Email address down in the description box. If you're stopping by the channel for the first time, guys, please consider subscribing if you want to. Hit that thumbs up button. Hit that post notification button so that you're notified when I upload new videos. Thoughts become things. If you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hands. You guys keep chasing your greatness. 
Never stop believing in yourself. Stay healthy, get wealthy, and I'll catch you guys on the next one. Peace.